Shall we pray? May the word of my mouth, O Lord, and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Peter is motivating his first audience, his first uh, readers. He's motivating them because they've fallen on hard times. And, um, you know, they're... um, He's encouraging them to persevere uh, because um, for Christians in this world to just live holy lives, we have to live our holy lives in the midst of suffering and in the midst of pain. His audience have fallen on hard times, and we can find this very clearly in the first few paragraphs or even sentences of First Peter. Um, in verses 1 through 9, and we went through the first two verses last week, Last Sabbath, in which Paul or, or Peter calls um, his audience or his readers are God's chosen people, God's chosen people. And he encourages them by telling them that God, the entirety of the Godhead, that is to say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are with them, explaining to them these be- in these beautiful words in verse 2, 1 Peter chapter 1, God the Father knew you and chose you long ago. What's happening to you is not unknown to God. In other words, you've been chosen and God knew you and everything that was going to happen to you in your life and his spirit. Notice what it says over there. It doesn't say say that God or the Holy Spirit will make you holy. He says that the Spirit has made you holy. And as a result, he says, you have obeyed him and have and uh, have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So in that one verse alone, we find God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit uniting around you and me, around, first of all, the, um, you know, the, uh, his first century uh, hearers or readers of his letter to whom he addressed his letter those Christians who are in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And by extension, to you and me today. And so, um, and then he makes it clear that, you know, part of his reason for doing so is to encourage them, not just to live holy lives, but to be able to, uh, to but, but in the midst of crushing pain and suffering that they were going through, as... Um, increasingly in their day, increasingly the population or the society or the, uh, that, uh, they, uh, of which they were part were increasingly turning on them or turning against them. And so he first of all uh, reminds them of the inheritance or the heritage that they have and how secure and how imperishable this inheritance is, this great salvation that has been gifted them through the life, the death, and the res- resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the first, or the, uh, the second two verses that were just read to us today speak of, of that. The praise, all praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus from the dead. And He says, now we live in great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance. Down to verse 6, we find the real reason why he says these things. When he says, So be truly glad. There is, there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. That was their life. Trials, tribulations, and not just metaphorically so. Today we speak of trials, we speak of pain, we speak of suffering. And perhaps to some of us, or to so many of us, uh, the, uh, the pain that we know probably is just metaphorical pain or psychological pain at that, not the pain of having to leave your home or having to be persecuted for your faith. I believe nobody can speak of that here, right now. But that is their situation. And, then, and it is, it is in, within that context that, that Peter encourages them all to, to, to soldier on, as it were, and, and to live holy lives in the midst of, in spite of their pain and of their sights in verse 13, onwards to verse 17. 
So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. And by the way, that salvation is already there. What he's saying is that when everything has been said said and done, the the king and his new kingdom that has been started, that, that Jesus Christ started when he came the first time, when he lived his life, when he died, and when he was resurrected from the dead, That salvation that is yours now, that is secure within you and with you now, with Jesus Christ, at the conclusion of all things, when he comes again, he will put an end to all of these things, and that salvation will finally be without its enemies. And you will have the inheritance that you've always had since the beginning of your walk with Jesus Christ. And so he says, and he says, uh, put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. And what he's saying is that they do know better, better now. And we do know better now. That's the context of the entire um, letter of first letter of Peter. But there's something bothersome about how Peter puts two words together. And he puts these two words together at the beginning, at the very beginning of his, of his letter. You may have noticed it. Those two words are chosen and foreigners. Chosen foreigners. Peter puts those two together as though they naturally belong together. It's the words chosen and the the words chosen and foreigner. You that those two words don't belong together, really. They're contradictory at best. And at worst, very painful to think that someone chose you not to be citizens, but to be strangers. He chose you not to be citizens, at least not in this world, but to be strangers in the land you've called your home. In the land where most of you, perhaps, in this land where you were born. The land that takes care of you. And perhaps Peter Peter should have said, chosen citizens. That would have been a lot more, a lot easier to swallow, perhaps. To be called by God to be chosen citizens would be a lot more comforting at least. But chosen foreigners brings back, at least to me anyway, uh, uh, brings back conflicting memories for someone like me who wasn't born in this country. And what? Of being taken from the land of of my birth, not taken uh, uh, against my will, of course. It was my mother's will. It was my family's will. And I was just a child, or at least a minor. And I was taken out of my my own comfort zone after my tongue is already set. And my mind filled with the memories of the old. Some of you can identify. Um, Taken to a strange land. And promised that this strange land was going to be a land flowing with milk and orange juice. And so it is. And so it is. And to stand out in this foreign land as a foreigner, like a sore thumb, at least those first few years. A foreigner in a strange land, that's who you are. And his audience, his readers back then, that that's who they were. And by extension, that's who we are. And I have a problem with that. A foreigner in a strange land, yet even if it was difficult for me, it is still difficult for me in some, way, in some ways, but it's a lot, it was a lot more difficult for me at, uh, starting out in a land that was very strange to me, leaving all my friends behind. to start a new life 
in a new country. Yet even how difficult this was for me, at least for me, my path led to citizenship. I can honestly tell you now, I'm a citizen of this country and I'm proud of it. Amen? I've been so for many years. Should have been many more years before that, but I dilly-dallied. And get this, my path not only led to citizenship, but family. I have an American family. Pharaoh gave me Maya Asenath. Her name is Julie. Have you seen Julie? There she is. Straight from East L.A. Can't get any more American than that, I suppose. And the Lord gave me my own Manasseh and Ephraim. Well, one happens to be a girl. It doesn't quite fit. And one of them, my firstborn, is about to graduate from high school and is about to go to the university. The University of Egypt. (laughs) I have a beautiful life in this beautiful country. And this country has accepted me as its own Despite, of course, my, my, my occasional linguistic lapses when I'm very, very tired and could no longer speak like Sometimes it does happen. Or my wife tells me, I dream in another language. It still happens to me. That's who I am. I'm an immigrant. And to be, sa- and to be told by Scripture that I'm not just an immigrant, but so are you. In the land where you were born is hard to accept. But Peter chooses his words very carefully. This is not something that Peter just says. It's, oops, did I just say that? Yes, I just said that. And yes, I meant to say that. Chosen foreigners is who we are. This is how Scripture calls you and me. Perhaps Perhaps to remind us that our path here in this world does not lead to citizenship in this world. It leads to citizenship in another, in another kind of world. And I can just imagine how painful this must be for you to read. Those of you who were born citizens in this beautiful country of ours. To be reminded not to get too close, too identified with the country you love, lest you forget who you really are. Who are you? Are you a citizen of this country, first of all, or a citizen of another country? Who is your king? To what kingdom do you belong? Do you belong to the kingdoms of this world? Or do you belong to the upside-down kingdom of Jesus Christ? And I can imagine some might find this a little bit painful, especially you who have stayed in this land, never left this land of your birth, the land uh, where where, um, everything is, is, is fine. It's almost worse for you, more painful for you, to be reminded that you're just a chosen foreigner here, in the land of your birth. Especially because the land cradled you, and the land and its people raised you, and the land, land has, not, has done nothing bad against you. Only good. And this land has given you a very comfortable life. Which is not the case among Peter's first readers They needed not reminding, or they needed no reminding, I should say, that they were foreigners in the land of their birth. Why? Because their land and their people had turned on them. It's a lot easier to remind somebody that they're foreigners when their own people have already forsaken them. But when your people have embraced you, and when your land takes care of you, it's a lot harder that you don't belong there. It's not where your citizenship is. But their people have turned against them. For what reason? 
for one and one reason alone, because they were Jesus freaks. That was the only reason. And for daring to be countercultural in the way they lived their lives, for proclaiming good news, for being good news, for being new creation in a world where old creation is just fine. Don't rock the boat. Just go with the flow. Peter was not telling them what they didn't already know, of course, because they were living this life as vagabonds in their own home. Peter merely states the obvious to them, that in their world, being good news turned out to be bad news. Bad news, indeed, that would cost them, some of them, or many of, many of them, their lives. And that they were being re- uh, reminded that their resurrected, their so-called resurrected life leads to no bed of roses, but leads instead to pain and suffering. And, and I, was, you know, I was just thinking about this, and, um, you know, I could see them just kind of cringing a little bit with this chosen foreigner, uh, you know, phrase. And, but, you know, what perhaps came as more of a shock to them was not so much the word foreigner, they knew that already, but the fact that they were chosen foreigners. Can you imagine what, what that felt like at first hearing? Um, You know, uh, at least mine led to citizenship and fine family, as I said. Theirs led to a life of misery. Chosen foreigners. Uh, You know, that, that, that phrase. And yet, there's a sense in which it doesn't really hurt, or it didn't quite hurt. At least not quite as it hurts now. Because in their day, you see, the afterglow of Jesus' life, the afterglow of Jesus' death, And the afterglow of his resurrection was still fresh on everybody's minds. The apostles were were still there to remind them what their life was all about. And the good news is still new to them. It's not so old. And so the stakes to them were a lot clearer than perhaps it is today. And pain and suffering makes things all the more plain and obvious to them. Pain and suffering tends to do that. It peels away all the facade and and keeps things raw and keeps things real. We're not suffering like they did. And so we we don't have it as bad as they did. Um, And we're all citizens in this land, right? How, How many here are not citizens yet? Don't raise your hand. You know who you are. You'll make it. I did. Don't worry. Just don't dilly-dally. When you qualify, go for it. I didn't, and I paid for it somehow. I'll tell you more a little bit about that. We're all citizens in this land, and even I am a citizen now in this adopted land of mine, and my beautiful Asenath is right here to testify to that. Um, um, And my Ephraim and Manasseh, and and my adopted land has been very, very kind to me indeed, and and, and life is good. And I love this country because I know what it's like not to be in it, not to live in it, and not to have the benefits in it. But I haven't really gone through anything close to what First Peter's first audience went through. If I ever suffered in this land, it's probably very, very minor and probably a psychological kind of pain of suffering. Most of the pain that I suffer, actually, I don't suffer. My wife suffers with with her pain. And because of that, we suffer with her. And we want to suffer with her. But my pain is mainly psychological, so I'm not as, you know, I'm not as affected by it. But this wasn't always the case with me, of course. I, you know, back in those days when um, I was adjusting and even after I thought I had adjusted, I remember the pain of being a foreigner in the land. And, and one of those things that actually brought this to, me, to, to, to mind, uh, or, uh, to mind uh, was, was when um, the discomfort, of, the minor discomfort of, of, you know, of being not a, 
a, a citizen in this, in this country must, was what happened to me and my wife when we went on a cruise, and this was a long time ago, in 2002, in November of 2002, about roughly a year after 9-11, which changed a whole lot of things in the way. So we set out from New Orleans uh, to the Western Caribbean and back, and we, sa- oh, we sailed for 10 days. And that wasn't fun in the sense that I had sailor's legs the whole way through. And I could barely keep myself from puking. But other, other than that, all the food looked good and they tasted good <laughs> and, every, and everything. And so we sailed for 10 days. And, and, you know, um, and of course, as I said, I dilly-dallied on getting my citizenship papers. And, and so um, I came, unfortunately for me, I came from a country which, had a pro- which has a problem with radical Islam. In the South, at least. And, and when we docked back in New Orleans after 10 days of sailing, uh, sailing uh, uh, the seas, uh, um, I was held back. They let my wife go, and they held me back. And they kept me in a room with a bunch of foreigners who didn't look like me and, and asked me all sorts of questions and, and um, water, waterboard me. <laughs> I was just to see if you guys are still awake. <laughs> they did not waterboard. They did not send me to Guantanamo Bay. No, none of that. Because when they realized that I couldn't, you know, I wouldn't hurt a fly, they let me go. But I tell you, that was the, that was the day when my dilly-dallying finally stopped. And, and as soon as we got home, I filed for citizenship faster than I can say Jack Robinson. Uh, because I knew what it was like to leave um, the country without a U.S. passport. And I, know what it's, I knew what it was like to return without a U.S. passport. My naturalist, naturalized citizenship paper, which I almost, actually I have it, it's in my office. I should have brought it here so you, you know what it's like, you know, what, what, it, what it looks like. And my passport, I'm, we're about to leave for the Philippines, me and my kids and, and uh, a friend of ours from, from, from here, uh, And I will be carrying a U.S. passport, thank you very much, and I will be proud of it, and I'll be a lot more secure with it, I'm sure. Um, But, you know, uh, I know what it's like to be without it. But with it, I feel safe. With it, I feel that I belong. And with it, I feel that I'm home in a land that has been good to me. In a land that has been good to us. Which is really the problem. Bigger than Peter's first reader's problem. We feel safe. They didn't. We belong. They didn't. We're comfortably home. They weren't. So when God's message fell in their ears that that they were chosen foreigners, it made sense. That God had infused their, their life with meaning, their hard lives with meaning, and it gave them strength. And to see their lives as God sees it, as the birthing of new creation into a world too long in the dead of winter. A world in need of spring, of new life, a world in need of you and me, of good news. We, on the, one, on the other hand, have to try a lot harder to keep it real because we're comfortable, we feel at home, and we're, in that sense, we're in a worse fix. What can we do? since we do not even begin to approximate the situation of 1 Peter or the readers of 1 Peter. Well, we have several choices. I'll name two of them. And you decide whether this is these first right for you. We can pray for persecution to come. Count me out. I'm not going to pray for persecution. Let, the, let sleeping dogs lie. The dog will wake up soon enough. 
Doesn't scripture say you live a holy life, the holier you get, the harder it gets? Leave sleeping dogs lie. Let sleeping dogs lie. Or we can behave as if we were being, were being persecuted. That's another option. But that isn't faith. That's not faith. What is that? It's not faith. It's paranoia. And in the medical world, they even have a word for that or a phrase for that. It's called persecution complex. And it's, um, it, those of you that are not in, in the medical field, I'm just telling you it's not good because it's a psychosis. Causing you to doubt everyone and everything and causing you to withdraw from the world that needs you. So no, those aren't good solutions for us Christians if we want to be faithful to the Word of God, to God Himself. What can we do? Simply this, we can live as Jesus lived by treating our comfort, comfortable lives as opportunities to practice loving on God and to practice loving on people. That's, it's as simple as that. Never forgetting that this lull we call the comfortable life, this bubble we live in, this eye, is actually the eye of the storm. That somehow, somewhere, you know, sometime, sometime, this eye of the storm will move and we will find ourselves in the thick suffering. When this comes, how you prepare in the eye of the storm will determine how you will live your life or how you're able to live your life in Jesus Christ in the midst of the storm. How well you've lived your life for God in times of comfort will determine how well you will do in times of pain and suffering. How do we live the life of Jesus in good times? By engaging in the spiritual practices of the Christian life. Which is why you're here today. Let me just mention to you some of these practices. I've listed them, a few of them to you. Um, let's see now. Oh, I didn't put that there. There, there, there they are. Jesus' practices of abstinence. Mind you, these practices are opportunities to become more and more like Jesus Christ when the going is good, so that when the going is, uh, gets tough, we are able to be like Jesus Christ when we, when we don't find ourselves anymore in the eye of the storm, where everything is sunny, where everything is fine, where everything is comfortable. Let's take a look at some of these Jesus' practices of abstinence. Solitude. Time away from human contact in order to be alone with God. That's a discipline we all need to learn. Silence, time of physical silence and away from human, from human noise and words in order to learn to listen to God. Fasting, abstaining from food and other things to teach ourselves to depend on God. Frugality, which is an extended form of fasting, Abstaining from using money to soothe our desires. Simplicity. Keeping the inner and outer life synchronized, unadorned, and singularly adorned only with God. Secrecy. Leaving our good works in God's hands in order to tame our hunger for attention, fame, and self-justification. Sacrifice, giving away something close to our hearts, even if it is painful and hard. And there are, of course, Jesus' practices of engagement. Here are several of them. Study, engaging the mind when, when alone with God. Worship, teaching body and mind to dwell in the goodness and the beauty and the greatness of God. This is why you're here. Celebration, learning to enjoy life appropriately as an expression of the grace of God. Service, 
learning to advance the good of others, including God's cause. Talk and listen to God. Fellowship, learning to worship, connect, and serve with and serve others. Confession, laying down the burden to high, uh, to, oh, that doesn't, that, that's, I'm ashamed of myself. This is, you know, say I'm still a foreigner in this land. Laying down the burden to hide and pretend. Oh, help me fix this one, Laura Lee. I botched it, didn't I? Yeah, there you go. Laying down the burden, thank you, Karen. Laying down the burden of hiding and pretending to be who you, who you're not. Uh, and starting to be who you are. There you go. There you go. I'm just a foreigner here. I, can, I have all the excuses. You don't. Uh, <laughs> so, anyway. And submission. Learning to be fully accountable to... That's what mutual submission means. Not to be a doormat. Not to countenance abuse. But to be fully accountable with one another. I'd like to see the day when we can all say that here. When we are comfortable to be known and to be fully known and we are no longer hiding behind a facade of respectability when we're not. These are the things, and of course Sabbath rest, learning to stop mind and body from engaging in commerce on the seventh day, in order to pursue God, freeing us from the work, from the worry of work and sustenance. There's a reason why God says, sunset to sunset, it's not to hem you in, it's to train you in His presence and to infect the rest of the week so that you take God with you wherever you go. Sabbath does that. So all of these things happen in good times. There will come a time when we will not be able to do any of these things in the comforts of this, of this house of worship, in your home, and wherever you may end up being. There will come a time when all of this will be taken away. What then? What then? It seems strange that Peter should refer to, to pain and suffering. You know, he refers, and, and I've already shown it, but I, I've kind of, I, I, um, it's in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. You can go, if you can go back there, Scott, for me, I would appreciate that very much. Um, let's listen to what he says, what, he, what, what Peter calls pain and suffering. He calls it grace. He calls it grace. I have written and sent this short letter to you with the help of Silas, whom I, I commend to you as a faithful brother. My purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you our experiencing is truly part of God's grace to, for you. It's strange that he should call pain and suffering part of God's grace for you. But that's how we become new creation in a world that's old and dying. When we're able to handle pain and suffering the way Jesus handled pain and suffering and to smile and to tell the world that there's a better kingdom, there's a better way of living than the life they're living. And it is through the life, the death, the resurrection, the power of Jesus Christ, whom God raised from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Our pain and our suffering doesn't compare to theirs. No, it doesn't. But we may be sure that God's grace is also ours in our little pain. These disciplines of the spiritual life in the eye of the storm and this is what it means, brothers and sisters, to live a life of true evangelism in this world. We don't do evangelism. We are evangelism. Those two are not 
mutually exclusive of each other. We are evangelism. A life of true evangelism is the new life where holiness and suffering meet. And this, my friends, is what Scripture calls new creation. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that Jesus Christ is alive and that because he is alive, we too are alive. Life of evangelism. Every moment of our life. And where we fall fall short, we, we know that there is no condemnation because in Jesus Christ we are free. As the old saying goes, fall seven times, get up eight. May the Spirit give us the strength to keep trying to be like Jesus, to be new creation to this world. For in his name we pray. Amen.